So can I introduce my panel and encourage them to, to come to the stage to join me? As I said, uh, where are they? The great John, John Burton, the head of Urban Regen for, for Lend Lease, part of it. Uh, where is Brett Newman, the CEO of the City of, City of Parramatta? Peter Poole, the, uh, the district, uh, the Central City District and Southern District Commissioner now for Great City Commission. See, Peter goes on the tour, he comes back with a new job. You know, the promotion's working already, other tourists. And Janet Quigley from the Federal Department of Structure in charge of the city deals in other parts of the country. We just want to give it the city deal for the central city as well, because we think that's, that's, that's a pressing one. Oh, there's all the names. I don't have to remember, they're actually on screen. That would have helped. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, thank you for joining us. Um, you might also have seen, you know, last, earlier this year, we also put out, because it was a big year, I think called Stuck in the Middle, our paper about the central city, um, the central river city, although the rivers need a bit of work. Um, first question, go to Janet first, because you're, you're looking at city deals around, around the country, you know, particularly in Queensland and Victoria, uh, or in South Australia. Yes. Um, and we spoke to Minister Tudge a couple of weeks ago about uh, our aspirations for um, the Western City city deal. So, I said to the Premier last night, it appears to be an experiment that's working. Um, I know IA is doing a bit of work looking at city deals and their effectiveness at the moment. When's the jury back in enough for us to say, if it works so wonderfully well for the Western Parkland city, why don't we, why don't we try it somewhere a little bit harder? Because almost in greenfield cities, you can see it's a little easier because people want the growth. The most densely populated part of Australia, that central city within. Do you think there's an appetite in federal government to keep this experiment going of a federal engagement by city deals? Uh, so, yes, I do. I think the Commonwealth Government is very interested in the city deal concept. We've currently got seven deals that have been signed uh, and another four in the pipeline, which is two in Melbourne, the SEQ deal and also the Perth deal, which has been around for a little while but has been reinvigorated um, in the last couple of months um, and is being actively negotiated at the moment. So. Um, there are varying scale and size. The city deals, as you would expect, are tailored to the different regions and their opportunities and challenges. We are still in our infancy, I think, in the city deal um, space. The oldest is three years, which is Townsville. And we are learning from all of the implementation, but also the negotiation and scoping of all of the deals. Um, they are resource intensive. Uh, we have a fairly small division in the Department of Infrastructure that manages the deals, but also um, across the state and local governments, they're very resource intensive. So the, we need to have um, that sort of capability and the cooperation from the various regions because we can't just force city deals onto particular areas. They have to be willingly engaged. Um, I think the government is actively looking at how we're tracking um, how we measure the deals, how we look at their effectiveness, and then what we do from here in terms of our pipeline. General, I mentioned before, and I know you're one of three governments involved in the city deals, but can you envisage a way that you can find a role for more productive engagement with the private sector and the community sector in the concept and construct of a city deal? So I think we're seeing predominantly that sort of private engagement in the implementation part of the deal, and we can see that in Western Sydney. There's a lot of acti activity happening around the rail and the... Um, and the development of the airport. But I think where we could focus better is in through the negotiation and scoping phase. Um, our minister generally holds roundtables when we start the process um, on, on um, developing the city deals. And he does engage with industry, but I think we could do that better. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons that is coming out of what we're seeing with our processes is that that collaboration and um, engagement can be enhanced. Um, I haven't got the sort of answer on how we would take that right. forward, but I think certainly we can look into that. John, you're at the core in London. The, the Midlands was famous invented city deals in the UK, and East London strategy never had one, but effectively was one working. They didn't call it anything, but it was a collaborative partnership to drive it forward of national government, citywide government, and, and the local boroughs, and importantly, the private sector. From your experience in East London, do you, you're back here now, you've been, you, Dan Labad, David Higgins, Tim Williams, three Aussies, one now extra Aussie who sort of drove a lot of that. What's your initial observation? Have you arrived home in a similar, you know, it's almost a time warp for you coming back to a place now that was uh, in the throes of what London was 15 years or so ago. 
where do you see a role to build a greater, rather than just an execution on a deal, I suppose I'm talking about that other bits of innovation, the city shaping that might come. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll address that, I think, in two parts. The, way, the first one is there is a role um, and there is a big role for the private sector in, in those early discussions. Um, and the discussion doesn't have to lead to any particular deal or a particular role for uh, the private sector because ultimately um, that will be decided um, through, through the projects. But the benefit of bringing the private sector into those early discussions uh, particularly pertains around um, the risks of development. And I think there, you know, the, it is the private sector that has um, many, many years of both successful and failed deals and understanding the risks related to planning, the risks related to letting, to deliver, to construction, um, the full gamut of development risks, those sort of discussions need to be drawn out with government when it's trying to formulate what a deal should look like because quite often um, my experience is that as those deals get formulated, um, the government looks to um, reduce the scope of and the potential of the private sector in, in deals. And in that way, some of the sustainability outcomes are reduced, um, some of the bigger place and precinct outcomes become quite reduced because the deals get effectively um, carved up. And there is a role for, gov for the government to talk to the private sector early without obligation. And I think one thing the government should understand um, is that there are many, many uh, private uh, sector participants in this room who will gladly give the government the benefit of their experience on a no obligation basis. Um, the, the second thing that I see is... I, I love giving government advice, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know. The, um, but the second one... The second one that, I'm, that is now starting to be Groundhog Day for me is... Um, as the government now continuously brings forward its um, infrastructure agenda, the access, the, the, the transport, and what that will unlock, I think, is becoming uh, visible to everyone. And there's two things that come from that, which probably people aren't quite ready for, and that is the velocity that comes with um, certain delivery. In other words, as the government perfects the delivery of that infrastructure, and particularly if there is certainty around that delivery, the government, the councils, um, the community will be surprised at the rate of development, um, the sort of onion ring effect that you get from that development, and we have to be um, ready for that. And as you've come back to, the biggest opportunity that we have with unlocking so much of this development is around um, housing typologies and the ability to genuinely bring forward um, forms of affordable and social housing in the next round of development. Peter, you and as District Commissioner, Liz Dibbs, the other great, the West, your colleague, great Western City District Commissioner, um, you, you're engaging, as best I've seen, the GSC uh, uh, trying to get a broader debate, a broader engagement going. Not to labour the governance point too, too much, but you saw the equivalents in GLA in London and the discussions they've had as part of that tour. Do you think we're capturing as much innovation, and not even, even though we're part of the world, just the big picture, what good are... What, what does a community look like? What, what can Campbelltown aspire to, sort of thing? Do you get the sense that there could be a, a more, a different way we can go about this conversation to think a little bigger, a little broader, before the property orders come and sit in the room when it comes deal time? I, I think we could be actually more, um, more progressive, more radical, and think much, much more uh, generously about the future. I think we are a little timid, and that's as a, result, as a result of being, I guess, siloed both in government and in communities. Um, I think we need to aspire to something that actually doesn't even exist yet. Uh, we need to be able to dream. And so that's where uh, the Commission plays a very important role. We've got a, a, almost a, a soft power role in that we encourage that capacity to, and, that, and, and that ability to think widely and generously and about the future. Further to that, we're directly engaged with the next generation of leaders. We, we've got a youth panel that, that we talk to regularly and we want to make sure that their voice is heard and that their vision is on the table as much as anybody else's. Um, 
th there was one particularly amazing uh, uh, Hazari woman that, that is on our youth panel. And when uh, we asked her what was important to her and to her community, she said education, housing, health, particularly mental health. That plays straight into the uh, conversation around place and around what sort of place we want to make. I don't have a physical vision of that. That really is the incumbent on us all to, to generate, and I think we need to dream generously and, and, and in a big way. Let's go back to the central city, and uh, Brett, you, you sharing with Matt Stewart and Canterbury Bankstone, who's here, are the two anchors, anchor LGAs of the central city, the biggest one in L LGA in New South Wales, and Canterbury Bankstone and Parramatta at the centre of the, the central city. Um, we spoke to Janet about possibly a city deal, but rather than sheer governance for now, you're also in the, you are GPOP. Parramatta Council is effectively also GPOP. Your big thinking of, you know, Parramatta had its first burst five years, Parramatta emerged on the scene and now it's almost in its teenage years of that lot in the ground, a lot more still to happen. You've got to take it to the next level. Do you get a sense that you can take that dreams and aspiration of the, of the city, its residents, and make it reality within a central city? How, what do you see this city we call it this north-south city looking like? Thanks, Chris. Big question. Um, I, I think, firstly, for Peter, Peter, you probably need to be careful suggesting that the Greater Sydney Commission is full of dreamers. You <laughs> might, um, yeah, that might get you in some trouble. But um, I'm eking out my own position. <laughs> um, I, I, I think one of my observations, I might be a bit contrarian on the city deal thing, one of my observations is that I think that the central city, city is particularly challenging because it's made up of a number of very distinct precincts. And each of those precincts actually are very different in their characteristics and what they're offering and what they're seeking to deliver. So I, I genuinely think, don't think there's a silver bullet. Now whether, I'm not sure if that means we need a city deal or not or we need something else in addition to it, but my, my views, and I'll give you a couple of examples, are that I think we need to think really deeply around designing bespoke leadership, governance and funding models for each of the precincts. Um, and that may support, be alongside a city deal. So for example, um, Westmead and even North Cumberland by contrast. You've got the map behind you now. Oh, that's great. Talking about. Um, and I'll use a couple of Parramatta examples, uh, not that I specifically want to focus on Parramatta, but Westmead as a precinct will be completely focused on health and health services as it should be. Contrast that to even Cumberland, which is likely to be a health research and an education precinct. Now, the key stakeholders, the key funding models and the key outputs in those precincts will be very different. And contrast that again to even the CBD, where we have 7,000 jobs being delivered in the next couple of months. Um, we have major commercial redevelopment. It will be a commercial heart, as well as a nighttime economy heart, as well as an emerging arts and cultural centre. So the stakeholders, the outcomes we're looking for in that precinct are quite different. So I think we need to deeply consider about the different models of governance, leadership, funding, and the outcomes we're looking for in each of those precincts. If you look up top, you like to see we've appropriated Hurstville and Cogra into Western Sydney now, so we're ever growing. Uh, in honour of the great Clive James, most away, but and Janet until the PM, we've offered to put the Shire in it too, if it if it helps. Um, we'll, uh, I'm surprised you haven't got Canberra in it's there. Not, it's not as silly as it sounds, because what is the central city? It largely is that great post-war suburban arc around city that was when I grew up. Parramatta was known as the Western Suburbs. I mean, Ashfield was the Western Suburbs, um, and so it is that that central part of the city. It's a north-south axis for a city. Again. Our problem being forever, we don't do north-south transport in this city, we do east-west transport. So our cities are not connected with each other. We're having to put one in for a north-south rail in the western city. We've talked, we've spoken in here in our review about the, upgrading the central metro from Cogra, Hurstville, Bankstown, Parramatta, Epping, or the hills through that way. We've spoken about the A6 and A3, King George's Road, Cumberland Highway upgrades that are needed if we're going to get serious. Andrew Constance committed to a bridge today over Parramatta River, a new bridge, which will be great, another through the central city to, to make it up. I called it the Poulet, Poulet Bridge, but he hasn't gone for it yet, Peter. I'll take um, it. You take it. So coming back to that, that point, um, can we, Peter, to you, is that a city that you look at? I mean, they're all artificial constructs in a way, 
uh, uh, precincts are, are more. How do you build that into the concept for governance for a city, but more so economically, socially, the social fabric of that spread? Look, I totally accept what Brett has said. There are, there are unique um, precincts and communities and groups of people that are really quite disparate and different. That's its strength, in fact. Um, we still need to manage that difference. We shouldn't try to uh, aggregate it or make it um, vanilla, so to speak. But that's its strength. And the fact that it has got that history, that, that post-war history that, um, of development, in fact, enriches it. Um, complexity is a good thing. Uh, difficulty is a good thing because good things come from having to work hard at success. Um, so the, center, the central city as it is now drawn, <laughs> Um, I think is right, because particularly Canterbury Bankstown um, is really part of that. Um, and boundaries are boundaries for, for convenience, not, for, not to make life difficult. So Liz and I particularly work very closely together, uh, West and Central. We should and we do, and the boundary is, as I describe it, porous. So I grew up in Dundas, which was halfway between Parramatta and Epping, and if you told the people of Epping in those days they were Westies. Oh, <laughs> talk about the greatest defence they could have. But I used to say, do you think the people of Mossman think you're on the North Shore? Um, just to square them up. Um, to, look at, to look at this map, um, again, we spoke about the North-South issues and came back to John's experience in London, the, the partnership it's going to require to drive this in the private, private sector. A couple of questions have come in. First one, maybe to John and Janet first. They're getting provocative out there on the floor. The Premier and Minister Constance have told us the last couple of days that our private sector, New South Wales and Australia, wouldn't opt into a value capture scheme like London did. How do we know it if we haven't tried it? John, do you think there is an appetite? You're, you, know, you, don't, you don't offer up all of Lendlease's billions to pay for it, but do you think there's an appetite in business to have a bigger role in helping to pay for that infrastructure? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, the, the point missing from the discussion last night was the history of um, how that decision actually came about in London. Um, uh, London first under the direction of Baroness Jo Valentine um, was a great way of pooling together the, the thought of the private sector to be able to agitate, uh, to argue for and, uh, and to put its, way, its thinking forward and, and they were respected by the City of London for, for that. Um, and they'd every done the same for the Olympic bit hadn't they? They'd rallied the troops. Yeah, they, they, they'd, done by, they'd, they'd stood behind that but what it actually meant was that the, the, the City of London had really a, a really good barometer for what the, the private sector thought. And every year, the City of London um, would go around to all its members, many thousands of them, and, and pool them and say, what are, the, what are the city's priorities from a business point of view? If we want to, and, the, and the argument was, if we want to remain competitive as a global city, what should we be doing um, at both a government level and a private sector level? And that's the history of why, um, year after year, the private sector said to the government, we must have Crossrail. Right? And the government said, we can't afford it. And the private sector said, well, we're, we're prepared to accept a, a form of value capture. And there were several forms of it. Um, one was the two cents in the pound. The other was um, various community infrastructure levies, which led to a bit of a reform around you know, what we would call Section 94. Um, payments, payments here. So I think having, knowing that there is a strong voice of the private sector, that a, a reliable voice of uh, the private sector would make the world a difference to the government. It, it's where does that voice get uh, originate and how does it get carried through? Because the last thing the government wants is, a, is an all-out brawl um, with, uh, with the private sector about imposing some form of value capture that, um, that the, the private sector is not prepared to support. So I th mm. there is a way through it, it's just we haven't found it yet. Janet, we heard from your colleague Malcolm Southwell earlier, the federal government's role and your department's role in, in Faster Rail, which you would like straight up the central city, thank you very much, <laughs> just take it at a time. Mossvale, Campbelltown, Liverpool, <laughs> just, just saying. Um, the, that would have to be probably the first federal project where there's potential to drive a federally mandated value capture process. Now, we know the Fed's voice, but I think probably unrealistically positive. Some previous ministers have spoken about 50% of a project, which I think is probably sent the Wales government back into the hidey hole a little bit about it. But if we had a serious approach, do you see a way or a discussion in the corridors of 
your departments about the role of value capture, value contribution, value, whichever we, whatever we call it, a way the private sector or other beneficiaries of those projects can help contribute to bringing it forward, making it better, making it happen? My experience with value capture has been through the lens of the city deal and one of the ones that I've been managing is the Geelong city deal and there is a value capture element to that deal, um, particularly along the shipwreck coast where there's a lot of investment in the tourism economy down along the Great Ocean Road. Um, it is a complicated space. We are working with the state government in developing a framework. I think Victoria might be the only state that has its own value creation and capture framework, which it um, uses in, in, a, in a state way. Um, so I think there is an interest, uh, particularly through the city deal lens, um, in exploring how we do that. And for um, my experience, that we're at the very sort of start of those discussions with Victoria at the moment, but um, I think it holds some promise in terms of um, understanding it through the city deal lens. Don't suppose they're getting too much cruise shipping down that shipwreck coast to be a little scared of the tourism operators, but uh, um, maybe one other question with the floor for you, uh, Breck. Uh, I've got to try and read it. How important is fast rail connectivity from the hills through Parramatta to Hurstville to unlock the central city, be that metro or the national faster rail? How, I know Parramatta's been having a view uh, about Canterbury, there's have, Canterbury's the same thing, that concept of the on the Never Never, the, the, the Cogra to Parramatta Metro, the Central Metro. Where, are you, where do you think that's at now? What's the Council's view? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Our view is that uh, north-south rail connection through the central city is critical. Uh, and, and it's critical to get people to jobs. And I think Minister Stokes said that one of the success factors will be jobs. Jobs drive economic growth benefits. Um, North-South north connection is critical and in fact it might be a really strong rationale for a city deal. That's the sort of thing where you can see the requirements um, for three levels of government as well as private sector. If the feds want to kick into the Metro West we said give them a city deal as well so it's we, the, we'd uh, bring them in. Yeah. Two metros would be handy wouldn't it <laughs> within? Like crosshairs Chris. <laughs> crosshairs. Um, to you Peter in a design sense uh, you're an architect and now you're a back in the architecture game, also at, uh, at Western Sydney Uni in your, in your spare time. Um, is there a natural urban form that these cities need? They've gone to the central city, apart from a California bungalow, which is pretty much the, uh, or in more recent times, some pretty ugly main street apartment blocks mm. that defines the central city. How do you manage that urban form? And also, from your social architecture perspective, how do you manage a city that's currently under stress from development, overall bad development, often bad governance, that's us and part of those councils, areas too, that's given bad urban form. How do you tell that community they're going to get a lot more people living amongst their, uh, in their central city? The long-term strategy is a, a cultural shift in expectation. People should expect good design everywhere and um, that doesn't come through regulation, that comes through people being good citizens. Um, that's the long-term answer. The short-term answer is, yes, you do need some regulation. You do need design review. You do need to put forward the best designers to give you the variety of housing that's required, both in terms of its, its, its nature and composition, but also in terms of its price points. That variety is, is difficult to achieve when sites are relatively small and people, developers are trying to maximise uh, returns on, on, on small sites. You get far better results when you have larger development potential to give you the variety and, and hence the public amenity that's required in communities to make good places. So the variety is important, both in terms of price point and in terms of uh, topology. I think you're right, Chris. L let's not beat around the bush. Um, when you're near a railway station, you're going to get more denser development. But that's not to say uh, we shouldn't have a variety or a scaling down of that development as you go further away from the station. And so people do have the choice, depending upon their point, point in their lives, as to how they live. And then, then comes the question, how do they move from housing typologies um, to suit their lifestyles at that particular time? And Peter, did, did planning get it wrong 20 years ago and they pretty much prescribed that Sydney siders don't want to live in apartments? 
Did they miss, as we were miss, did they miss a migration, migration issue that changed that? Did they miss my kids who have no interest in a backyard? They wouldn't mow my backyard, won't mow their own. Um, do we, have, have, is, is playing the GSC, particularly now the modern manifestation of that, change that tilt towards a more urbanity and less sub, sub, suburbanity? Um, no, I, we're not going to lose the suburbs by any means, but we are going to, as I said, give the variety between the, the tower block and the apartment and the suburban house. So there's a, there's a number of typologies that exist. I think there's a number to be developed and invented yet. That's why I'm actually interested in talking to the next generation of designers at Western Sydney uh, Architecture School because that will be one of the propositions we put to them. What's the, the housing model that's unique to your community, that's, uh, that's unique to your place, that's going to be uh, uh, a new invention and hence a great marketable thing for, for, for the industry and a good thing for your community? Twitter's on fire here, one for Brett and Janet. Are our councillors and elected officials up to the job of making a city do a work in the central city? Can they manage the challenges of density and population revolt already? Hmm. Can, you, can you impose a city to do on a brownfield site? It's a lot harder than the greenfield site. We say you have to do it because it's harder, not you can't do it because it's harder. Um, you know, it's not quite Chatham House rules, but how do you... How do you reckon uh, we're, we're going to go and managing it in a tougher climate of the central city? Did you want to start? Yeah, th <laughs> yeah thanks very much, both of you. Um, Here's a fine, but Janet's are worried. Janet. <laughs> He's a career limiting question there. Uh, look, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, I, I think if you firstly start with the, the great work that the Greater Sydney Commission has done in the plan for, this plan for Sydney, um, and the recent um, infrastructure compact, it's, it's launched for the GPOP, combined with, um, at least in the local government areas case and a th uh, of Parramatta, and I think other central city local councils are doing the same thing, recognising and actually planning for increased density in the appropriate places, picking up the theme that Peter has done. Uh, definitely our, our council has acknowledged and recognised that that is critical to the success of the city and I'd make that comment across the whole of the central city and in fact it's critical if we need to manage and, and continue to create um, great places where people want to work and live in, in the face of a doubling of population, uh, the need for over 100,000 additional dwellings, 150,000 additional jobs and also our forecast that over the next 20 years, 70% 70, 70 of people will live in apartments. The, the reality is we need to, and uh, I think councils are up for that, and you can see it through the planning being done now. Right, before I go to Janet, could you show your bona fides to federal and state government already? Could the councils, and we're talking, this, we're at our first meeting already, should the councils of the central city get together and think about how do they establish the planning partnership now without a city deal? How do they work out a cooperative corridor for the road upgrade and the rail line. Do you think the leadership would come from, and I think it needs to come from the local councils in the region to say to both levels of government, we want a city deal, we're ready for a city deal and all the, the other benefits that can come with it. Do you need to take the lead? Um, I, sh yes, and I think a combination of the state government and councils are already doing that. Um, the funding that the planning department has put into allowing councils to harmonise their LEPs, um, the work that councils are doing around setting new, new planning proposals. We've just um, launched the CBD planning proposal, which is a new planning proposal for the entire CBD. Um, entire CBD. That shows our bona fides in the desire and the need to work together for the right planning outcomes. Janet, was it they need that, that, would that be a good starter? I think so, yes. Um, I d I'm not familiar with the councils personally in central Sydney, but one of the crucial parts of the process for us in developing the city deal is having the councils come together with a collective view of what they want done for their region and that that aligns with the state view. That helps incredibly in terms of how we negotiate and scope out the deal. Um, and in, often you've got negotiations starting with groups that have already established their own mechanisms and forums to come together. The SEQ, like, Council of Mayors. That's so, right, exactly. And your suburban Melbourne experience, what, is it, what, what, what do we learn from that and putting suburban city deals together? So Melbourne, we've only been engaging over the last couple of months, but there are very discrete groups. South East Melbourne have got a collective 
of councils, so have North and so have West. And it just makes that engagement, particularly at the beginning of the process, so much easier when you've got a mechanism to be able to engage and get a collective view. And when they've been working together for a while, that happens much more easily than bringing them together as a new And we re recast that, because the rocks, let's face it, aren't working in the city. So there needs to be the new collaborative measures. The, the city deal for the Western City has a new collaborative council working much better. John, Mr. conscious Chris, of time. Can I, just, Sorry. can I just comment on that intensification yeah, one? Because um, I think one of the mistakes we make is, as we get new infrastructure, we don't realise that over a very long period of time we're going to have to intensify the uses around it. Mm -hmm. um, on Brett's um, City of Parramatta website, um, under a section called Invest and Build, very, I think one of the first slides there shows a vision of the, the, the city, um, you know, over the next, um, I don't know, I can't remember what time scale you've got on it there, Brett, you know, maybe it's 15 or 20 years, and it's you suddenly realise that this is, um, this is a genuine city that we're talking about. But it's, it's wrong to think that that's where it will stop. Right, because we need to, uh, as our utilities get stretched, as the infrastructure gets stressed, we have to put um, more and more development in there. We've got to pay heed to uh, the green spaces, to access to, um, you know, the waterfront, uh, like your civic link, you know, where you can go fast and where you can go slow. But I think we make mistakes when we tell people it's only going to get denser once, once more. The London plan... Has a, has, has a 50-year plan. It gets revised every three to five years and it looks at what it needs to deliver in terms of greater height, greater densification whilst pre preserving some critical um, sight lines. But that's about extrapolating the most out of the infrastructure um, that is already in that, um, in, in that area. It's wonderful when you think about the city shaping in the Sydney-London equivalent. London is today the population of what Sydney will be in 20 years' time. We're planning for that 20 years' time now. Are we planning to meet that population even better than London has done? Um, last question I'll throw probably to, to, to John and Peter, and uh, it's about social housing. And let's be honest, the majority of social housing requirement is in the central city. The majority of job creation is in the central city. There's a reason we call it central, not only geographic, it's the centrality to the social and economic fabric of our city as well. Uh, John, again, from your experience in London, and Pete won't be putting on your, your architecture hat as well. I think it's a fair statement to make, and I'm, I'm, anyone can contradict me, but incrementalism in a transfer to social housing isn't working for us. We have such a backlog of demand, of aspiration, of people wanting to own their own home that we're just not going to meet. And a question above all of my young staff and my children, how in God's name, if we don't do step change, we don't get the jumper leads out in Western Sydney terms and, and rev up the, the transfer of, of property, the, the growth of the social housing uh, uh, providers and the growth of sheer numbers. We'll discuss in the Metro panel next some of the physical side, but your London experience, John, what was, how did London get to 30%? How do we get from five to 30? What is, what, what's the big change that we need to adopt in the central city to take a more than fair share load? Maybe, maybe I just quickly start that with a view as to what's driving the, the change here. Um, we are well behind the UK and other parts of, of Europe, but you know we have an ageing population here, but we also have very distinct changes going on in our much younger demographics in terms of their aspirations. Um, their lifestyle is all leading much more towards uh, less, uh, less home ownership, but more uh, rented type type models and you know job stability um, plays a huge uh, uh, um, part in that so here you know we need to do it at scale we have some issues uh, at various state and commonwealth levels around um, taxation but I can I, I see movement already on on some of those because there are major investors particularly from uh, from overseas that that wish to invest in all levels of uh, build to rent whether it's the uh, the PRS level or affordable or, or social, but we have to do it at scale uh, because the only time that we're actually going to get genuine social outcomes with this is when we do it at scale and we provide the softer infrastructure into those development. A tower block at a time or t at 20 units is, is not going to get, it, get us there. Um, we, need to, we need to do some trial sites. You know, we, we need some proof of concept 
and you know I would encourage you know, both private sector and public sector to find um, you know land to to do some of that to see wh which models work best. But um, it is a tsunami approaching Australia. I know you know for example in Melbourne uh, directly there are there are 600,000 renters in Melbourne who are below uh, who are in genuine stress levels. In other words, they, they can't afford their rent, the rent that they're paying at the, the moment. I, I'm sure the numbers in Sydney are not a lot different, and we're going to have to um, react to that quickly. I swear to Pete, Pete, it's fair to say this city, we've just gone through the most amazing property boom, and we missed the boat on when developers would have copped any level of to get their approval to put some social housing in. Having said we missed that, how do we not miss it next time round? How does the Commission lead the charge to ensure we get particularly in the central city, which can take more than its fair load of that social housing change? It's not a design issue. It's um, the biggest step change that you can get is if you revise the business model or, or change that business model. Um, for too long, we've looked at you know, individual housing as, as being a, uh, a commodity to be traded or, a, or, or, or motivated by profit. Um, housing's a human right. So yes, you're right. Um, we do need to improve our, our capacity to house our population. Having said that, what is the business model? Who changes that? That's, that's a government and policy uh, lever that the designers don't really have their hands on. We've got opinions about it, but I'm not going to pretend I know the details. We've got a former policy director of the Property Council as the Prime Minister, so I'm hoping we get a little bit of change and uh, it's going to take some federal reg regulatory change, some state planning change and, as John said, some good citizenship in the private sector. Oh, I think that's the you get all three of those right and we'll start making a change. Speaking of making a change, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you, if you haven't got them, here's our greatest, uh, get your hands on some of the, the Stuck in the Middle report and the London report. We make them all very available on the, on the uh, website so we get as much conversation going as we can. This business of city shaping is long, deep and very, very important. It's economic and social. Um, it's infrastructure and it's governance, it's all sorts of things. I'm delighted to have four serious players talking about a serious issue up here today and uh, hopefully we, we, we kick the issue along a little bit on some of those important parts. Please thank uh, John, Janet, Brett and Peter.